Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever-blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and that sometimes messy thing we call life. This podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit Milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we're back for another episode. Brand new guest, uh, Casey Taylor. Thank you so much, Casey, for making time to hang out with us today. Yeah, of course. Thank you. I'm so excited. We were actually having some pretty interesting conversation before we started. <laughs> and this is one of those times I've said this so many times now, like I, I I wish I had kind of hit the record button or like we need to do a second version of bonus episode of the podcast and share the extra conversation. But I, I think we might get into some really interesting conversation in this episode as well. And everybody listening in, we're going to actually talk not just about Instagram, but more specifically how to simplify your efforts in Instagram marketing. I'm a huge fan of simplicity. In fact, that's a lot of what we talk about here at the podcast. We want to figure out ways to work simply so that we can maximize the freedom, the flexibility that we have as business owners. So I appreciate you being willing to come and chat about that today, Casey. But I want to start off with a a quick question, and that has to do with customer experience. This is a new question that we've begun asking our guests. What would you say is the most important principle behind providing a wonderful customer experience? I love this question so much because customer experience is huge for me. And so my biggest principle here is it's not about you. It's about them. Yes. Really simple. I, and, and I love that. That's it too. And, and yep. this is a, first of all, to highlight the idea of simplicity, but secondly, this is a reflection on an idea that has been kind of a theme here at the podcast. We've talked a lot about Donald Miller's book, building a story brand and mm-hmm. how in that book, he emphasizes the significance of making the client, the hero of their story versus talking all about ourselves. A lot of photographers, you go to their website, you pull it up and it's all about them uh, versus telling the client, Hey, here's, I'm, here's how I'm going to add value to your life. And at that point, the client can make a decision about whether that resonates with them or it fills the need that they have making it all about them. I think we need to do much, much more of that. Oh, 100%. I'm 100% there with you. I, and I also feel as small business owners, it's challenging to talk about yourself and it you don't really need to like tell someone your entire life story to sell your product or service. <laughs> it's true. I Well, you know, I think to, to, to the photography industry's credit, um, I started it back in 2001. So I've kind of seen where we've wow, come from. Yeah. yeah, the last couple. Yeah. Wow, exactly. The last <laughs> 20 years or so. Um, but I've, I've kind of seen this, this progression going from film to digital and mm. kind of this formal approach to running a photography business to a much more open, more personal approach. Like many things in our culture, we've, the, the pendulum has swung to the opposite extreme and we've kind of overreacted. And so we've gone from, you know, being these uptight, boring business people to just spilling our guts and putting everything out there for the sake of quote being personal. And and there's some value to it. I don't want to minimize that, but I think mm, we've yeah, gone, there definitely is. yeah, I think we've gone to an extreme though. And it's taken away from the significance of how we can potentially add value to the client's life. Because at the end of the day, that's, that's, what's going to sell them um, or why they're going to want to buy us. And yes, they're going to buy into our personal brand, no question. But they need a wedding photographer and they need a portrait photographer and they want a particular kind. Are you effectively communicating how you're going to deliver that service to them? It's a really important question. So uh, anyway, I love the brevity of your answer. I'm going to stop talking and go to the next question. <laughs> what is your photography business's brand position? And if for everybody listening in who's not familiar with the concept of a brand position, this is just the unique value proposition your photography business offers to your market in one phrase or sentence, if possible. What is yours, Casey? Yeah. So I love this question. So for me, I also, I have a personal brand that I've built for years longer, but even before I was a photographer. And so my personal brand mission is to help people see their own unique beauty, which obviously ties into photography as well. And so for me, I just really love celebrating 
life with my clients. So my photography tagline that you, you'll see on my website is just real people having fun. What does that mean too? I mean, I, I like, yeah. this, again, the simplicity, the brevity of that. What does that mean on a practical level for your clients? So I actually had a client say that about me. So that's where that came from. I had a client who her what her maid of honor was a wedding photographer in Birmingham, Alabama, and she did the research on wedding photographers in the DC area. And she sent my client a really long list of great photographers. And she chose me because she felt like my photos showed real people having fun. And so what that means to me is that I really want to photograph my clients in the most authentic way to them. And again, that goes back to serving them. Um, So I like my engagement sessions specifically are really, really tailored to my clients. I take a lot of time planning with them um, to make their engagement session feel like the two of them. And then having fun is like just, I mean, that's the whole reason I got into this business. Weddings, like I think being a wedding photographer is one of the most fun jobs in the world. We get to hang out with clients who are, it's their, it's the best, one of the best days of their lives yeah. and all of their people, there's so much love. And so I just really always want to focus on having fun. Cause I also think that when you're having fun, that's when I get the best photos of my clients. So I work really hard on my client experience to make sure that my clients feel comfortable enough to be themselves and then add lots of fun things along the way too. Well, and I'm actually on the homepage of your website for everybody listening in. If you go to Casey, C-A-S-E-Y, Crow, C-R-O-W-E, Taylor.com, you can, you can look at the same thing that I am, but I'm, I'm on my desktop looking at this and that, that tagline or that position statement, real people having fun. I, I don't think I've ever seen it done this way on, on your site. It actually stays in the center of the screen as Yay. you scroll down the, the website. It's kind of interesting. What was the thought process with that? I just, so... Again, this goes back to being really simple. I know that um, I've been in business for three and a half years, and I always hear from my clients how stressful planning a wedding is, how stressful it is finding all of your vendors. And with that in mind, I wanted to be like, okay, cool. How do I make booking me the most simple? So what I really wanted here on my homepage, I wanted people to see, like I wanted the portfolio to be there. They can see my, a handful of my favorite photos. Yeah. They get my value statement. There's a button right there in the center that says book your wedding. And I just really wanted it to be as easy as possible. And I didn't want them to have to go to the experience page if they were sold on this. They don't have to dig around to find content on my website. Everything is really simple. Um, yeah, I was going to comment like, on that that call to action, that book your wedding right there dead center. Again, I don't know that I've seen that on anybody else's site. There, I've seen call to actions before. But that's about as straightforward and as simple as you can get. It's great. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think that you don't have a lot of time, especially so Washington, D.C. area is super saturated with wedding vendors. And so I know that if someone is searching on like Google or they're looking on Instagram and they come to my site, I have about five seconds where they're going to decide if they're going to engage with me or not. And so I really wanted to just take that five seconds to tell them to book me. <laughs> well, you know, we could we could almost end the podcast episode just with that statement and we would have added value to our listeners' lives. People have literally, as a photographer, we have seconds to mm-hmm. sell that potential client. We have to remember that. This is something I was just talking about in a presentation I did at a conference uh, in San Fran just, just recently in the last couple of weeks uh, about the reality, which is when somebody lands on your site, we have to remember that they're, they're, they're in Instagram scrolling mode. That's the kind of the mm-hmm. way that we function these days. They don't have time to read through paragraphs of information. Again, about you, the photographer, a little bit of information might be helpful at some point, but we need to make it as simple and as easy as possible. Number one, to know the, the value proposition and number two, to be able to ultimately book you as a photographer. And, and you've kept that front and center literally scrolling all the way down the homepage, <laughs> which is pretty, pretty ingenious idea. It's really interesting. I hadn't seen that before. So I had to comment on that. The other thing that you mentioned yeah. that was really interesting, though, was uh, the difference, the differentiation between a personal statement or position statement, mission statement really is what it is and a business's brand position. And this is also something actually that that I commented on recently in that presentation in San Francisco. Uh, I, I found an article by a guy named Jason Brewer at brolick.com. 
And he made kind of a, it might seem like a bit of an extreme statement, but it's really interesting. He said, they don't care about your grand vision for the world unless that vision somehow improves their life or their bank account. Um, Now, again, I I realize that might come across as extreme, but for the sake of conversation, sharing our personal mission statement may have some significance, but it's not as important as communicating what it is that we're going to do for our client. So one of the ways, one of the things he said, and I think it was in that same article, he talked about how the mission statement is for the company, or, you know, if there's a team of people mm-hmm. associated with the company, it's for that team of people. We, so we're all on the same page. We know what we're actually striving toward. But then the, the brand position statement is for the client or the potential client. And I really love that differentiation. Yeah, I think um, Dean Graziosi says people buy from you when they feel understood, not when they understand you. Ooh. And that that is a sentence that I repeat oh, that's over so and over good. to myself. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, say that one more time. Yep. So Dean Graziosi says, people buy from you when they feel understood, not when they understand you. What does that mean to you? So for me, that means um, when I'm thinking about, you know, the e- like my email templates, the way that I'm communicating with my clients, I want to make sure that they feel understood by me instead of me focusing on, do they understand what I offer? Does that make sense? Yeah. I I mean, that's, and it's really as clear as day. I I like that, again, the simplicity, the brevity of that. And I think that speaks loudly to the significance of, of having a clear and distinct brand position right there front and center above the fold for the potential client to see. So we'll finish on that note. And that is, that is a really great quote. I'm sure Haley might just grab that and create a soundbite from it for, uh, for social media too. It's really good. I appreciate you sharing yeah. that with us. Um, as a business owner, finding free time, it can be difficult. And I know that you told me that you're a, a relatively new mom too. That's a whole experience in and of itself. <laughs> How are you not balancing probably isn't really the word, but how are you managing a business and doing family life and having a little bit of personal time for yourself? Do you have particular workflow tips or techniques you can recommend? Yeah. So I have, I have two things that are really important for me to feel successful. Okay. You know, the first thing I will say, so my daughter is um, just over a year old. She is in full-time daycare. She does phenomenal in daycare. It's the best. But so every weekday, I wake up, hydrate, I move, and I do at least 10 minutes of meditation before I ch- check any application on my phone besides yeah. the baby monitor. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So I want to make sure that I start my day and I don't start my day reacting to an event that's on my phone. So no text messages, no email, no Instagram scrolling, nothing besides opening the baby monitor to make sure that my daughter is not screaming her head off while I'm working out on the Peloton bike. (laughs) 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 And that just makes a really big difference in my mental space. I feel like, and and I have to wake up before my daughter and get myself ready. Cause if I wake up when she wakes up, I'm just, I drop her off at daycare and I'm exhausted because I've just started my day reacting to something and then reacting to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. So that's my Monday to Friday routine that I have to do in order to feel like I'm in my own mental space and I'm controlling my time. And then on Monday mornings, I usually take the morning off to just do whatever. If that's like sit in front of Netflix, I just want to take that time to decompress because I have, I'm coming out of being with my daughter all weekend, Yeah, which is so fun. It's the most fun age right now, but it's exhausting fun. So I try and take some kind of time on Monday morning to just hit reset and be alone with myself. So those are my two ways that I carve time for myself being a business owner and a mom. That's really good. I mean, the significance of starting off proactively versus reactively, Mm -hmm. we're, we're business owners. I think most of us anyway, largely because we get to be our own boss and yet we give up that, that right or that ability by constantly reacting to everything. So Mm -hmm. I I love that you start off the day proactively. It's a brilliant, brilliant reminder. I think that was an Ed Milet. If anyone is a fan of Ed Milet, I think I heard that on his podcast that that's how he starts his day. And I was like, wow, I've got to try this. And now um, I just find that if if I don't do this, my day just, I'm not as focused. It's really strange, but it's really impactful. Oh, that's good. And, and then, you know, I mean, the significance of giving ourselves space, it sounds like such a 
you know, 2020 first world thing to say, but the, in fact, I just recently had um, a surgery and the recovery time I was in basically on bed rest for a good bit of a week. And so I didn't really do work a whole lot. And uh, I spent, honestly, I spent a lot of time watching, have you ever seen Outlander? No, but it's on our list. Oh, and, and it's it's quite good. I, I've been quite taken. I'm a bit of a romantic sap, and so I I, I really like I got into this this show, um, and not just because it's only romantic, but I mean it's it's exciting, it's adventurous, it takes you literally through time, and um, the storytelling is quite interesting, and you really get into the characters. Anyway, I spent a good bit of a week just kind of consuming this show, but it was really interesting to observe, kind of um, outside of myself after the fact how different I felt mentally and physically having given myself such a break from work. I, I, um, you know, even if I have the freedom, the flexibility to, to get some work done and go take an hour and do this and then get a little bit more work done and do this other thing. And, and, and I had that flexibility to actually totally shut down, you know, 99% anyway, it was just, it was so life giving, um, to, to yeah. give my brain a break, to give my body a break on bed rest, largely because I had to be, but also the physical rest that came from that was incredible. We we need to give ourselves that in some form or fashion, and I think on a more regular basis. Oh, for sure. I think, you know, I am technically in my slow season, right? Because um, I'm, in, I'm in the Northeast for a wedding photographer, but I've never, I mean, last year I was on maternity leave. And then two years before that, I started... I started another business. I've never, and I need to be better about this. And I feel like we all do, but I definitely need to be better about taking time. But like, for me, I'm like, oh, I don't have any weddings on my calendar for two months. Let me start this whole new endeavor because <laughs> I have all this time. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I feel like besides vacation, um, probably work more. Uh, no, not probably. I definitely work way more than I ever have at like a company. I definitely took way more vacation when I was working in corporate career. Isn't that wild? Yeah, I mean it's mm-hmm. it's ironic and mm-hmm. and well, I I just think that we ultimately need to create that space. So I love that you do that for yourself on a regular basis now too. I think it's really really wonderful. And and speaking of running our business a bit more proactively and and intelligently, is there is there something or some things that you outsource or delegate in your business? And by the way, I I, I keep hearing people talking about they, they use the word outsource and they say, do you outsource? And somehow by default now in our industry, in the photography industry, it automatically means outsourcing image editing. There are mm-hmm. a variety of things that we can outsource. I think a better word is delegate oh, yeah. in our business administratively. You know, the creative part, I think most photographers want to maintain themselves and that's fine. But or at least with, when it comes to actually capturing the photographs, but even there, you can bring on a team and you can delegate certain work to them. And of course, editing, album design, accounting work. I mean, the list goes on. We can delegate in a variety of ways to ultimately more effectively scale and run our businesses. Are there some things like that that you're doing? Yeah, 100%. So I I outsource about 90% of my editing. The way that I edit right now is um, specifically for a wedding. I do sneak peeks pretty much the morning after every single wedding. I do about 20 to 60 sneak peek photos. Cool. And then... I will call through that wedding probably Monday and Tuesday after that. And then it goes off to my editor. And that has majorly changed my business because I can deliver weddings in two to four weeks. Yeah, which, um, is, which is huge. I mean, I know that I, I think by default, a lot of photographers it's, it, that aren't delegating or outsourcing their editing work, um, you're talking about a, a six, eight week turnaround time, potentially more in some cases. And it's really a disservice to that client experience you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I send it off to my editor and then I probably spend about one to two hours. Um, I still go th- after I get it back from my editor, I still go through every single photo because it's really important to me that every single photo is finessed by me. And I do do some light like Photoshop retouching and things like that where it's necessary taking out distractions. So I still go over every single image before it's sent out to my clients. But for whatever reason... I know that I can edit an entire wedding, but I drag my feet thinking about doing it. So it has saved me so much time and made me so much more money. And delivering weddings in a two to four week range, you just hit in the emotional time. I feel like yeah. once the, the first month is kind of, they hit their first anniversary and they don't have more photos to choose from, you kind of miss an opportunity to 
not only serve your clients, but have them market for you for free. You said that you make more money. And this is an interesting comment when it comes to Mm -hmm. outsourcing. It's not something that I think most photographers think about. Can you explain what you mean? Yeah. So the amount of, I think I probably pay between three or $400 for a full wedding to be edited. Yeah. And what I mean by I make, so I have more time to make more money because I'm not sitting in front of my computer for however long it would take, it used to take me maybe eight to 12 hours. That's especially as a parent now, that is like two full work days that I get back. And the other thing about outsourcing my editing, I have delivered a wedding in two weeks and had like the bride's brother or the, or a bridesmaid from that wedding book me two weeks later. Wow. Just because of that experience. I think so. And I think, yeah, just knowing that I have that quick turnaround, I turn around a really beautiful product in, in, in two to four weeks. Um, you know, I always tell my clients six to eight, just in case life happens. I had that happen to me last month where I wound up delivering in five weeks, but I really try and hit between that two to four because I feel like you kind of ride the wave of emotion after a wedding. And I just feel like people are more excited to share it when you can deliver it quicker. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, I think, I'm I sure think, there's, I think that sums it up beautifully, honestly. I mean, that, yeah. and you know, I was, I actually just saw this, I think it was this morning. There's a UK company called your perfect wedding photographer that put out a, a survey, 300 plus professional wedding photographers. And the data that they got back was, was pretty interesting. 55% of their time, I guess in a week, shall we say, that the time that they spend working on their business, 55% is spent on photo editing, following by business administration, 18%, calling 11%, and communication, 7%. So the things that we, that especially the communication, the relationship building with our clients that we should be spending the majority of our time on, mm-hmm. the least amount of time is being spent on that. The majority is being spent sitting in front of a computer, doing something that somebody else can effectively do if we know how to communicate, how we know how to delegate that work to another company or to another individual. Somebody else can do that for us. So it frees us up to do exactly what you were saying, to to ultimately to shoot more, but to to focus on creating a better experience. And I think that's just really, really important to to remember. Yeah. Or you can spend time marketing yourself too. 100%. When you're not, when you're not constantly editing photos, I think, you know, marketing becomes such a heavy weight on people's shoulder because they feel like they need so much time for it, which you do, um, to have effective marketing. But yeah, there's so much you can do when you're outsourcing your editing. But then, you know, I do know a couple of photographers who really love their editing, but they are, they're still getting their sessions out two to four weeks. So like if it works, it works. If it doesn't, outsource it. Yeah. It, my... if it, yeah. I, but I think too, just to, to push back a little bit, I think for the sake of everybody listening in too, as you're considering your options, because you know, again, that's the, the the wonder of being in first world culture, running our own business. We have a lot of options. Mm-hmm. The question is, what is our end goal with our life? First of all, if you want to go really deep and, and then with, as a result with our business, and does this activity, whether it's editing, album design, administrative work, you know, email management, accounting work, et cetera, does this support our end goal? If it does, great, do that thing. If not, why are you holding on to it? Is it ego driven? Is it is it a control thing, which is ultimately ego driven? Like what is the reasoning behind that thing? And are there you know, one of the things that I've heard who knows how many times at this point, um, is an assumption that a lot of photographers make, especially when it when it comes to editing specifically that if they don't touch the images, the clients aren't going to be happy. And it's an assumption that they make Mm -hmm. without the client giving that information to them. They just assume that's the case. But I think about, you know, for myself, so I own a color correction company, an editing company, have for about 12 years or so now. I was a photographer for over 10 years. So my eye is, is relatively refined. And yet I am so excited when I look at my refrigerator with it's all the little tiny blurry poorly color corrected snapshots of me and my kids on the refrigerator. I'm, I'm stoked. I'm beyond excited about those images and it has nothing to do with whether or not those images are perfectly color corrected or cropped or otherwise. Oh, 100%. 
And I don't want to minimize the significance of delivering a quality product, but the idea that we put so much weight on these images having to be perfect, and it's a very subjective thing, how we see it as photographers, and it needs to look that way for the client to be happy, is ultimately causing us to suffer. I mean, again, you look at that number, 55% of our time spent on editing when we could be spending the majority of our time building our business and then going and spend time with our family and having that Mm -hmm. space that we need for ourselves. It's just way better time spent. So ask the bigger questions. And, and make sure that what you're spending your time on actually supports that, uh, those, those goals. It's really important. Yeah. And I always tell, you know, my coaching clients when they're like, when I start to hear them say, oh yeah, I've started that, but I haven't finished it. And yeah, that's been on the back burner. And I'm like, cool. Can we outsource that if it's been on the back burner? Right. Cause that's, that's the approach that I take. So I also have a content producer who, who works with me. And so she proofreads all of my blog posts. She does all the SEO backend stuff. She runs all the numbers on all of my um, social media platforms, my Google analytics, which I've had forever and have never properly used. And she does all like my pins. She does all of the really nitty gritty content stuff. Oh, that's so um, helpful on the back end. Yeah. Because I just kept pushing it back, pushing it back. And then I also, for my my upcoming podcast launch, I have an editor and a producer for that as well. Yeah, I, shout out to Haley who produces the podcast. <laughs> I, I'd be in massive trouble if if I didn't have her help. And, and it's more than help. I mean, she she spends so much time editing these shows and, and producing the show notes and the social media posts and everything to go with it. So shout out to her. That, that makes a massive difference. Can you share the name of the podcast where our listeners might be able to find it? Or is that still kind of under wraps? Yeah, no. So the podcast is called the Rule Breaker Podcast. Okay. And that is going to launch sometime next month, which is March. Very cool. Awesome. Well, which would be probably close to the time that that this episode is coming out. So we'll make sure to get that information, uh, put that information in the show notes. For everybody listening in, speaking of the show notes, bocapodcast.com. You can probably find show notes in some of the podcast apps that you use, but they don't always show up the same way or, or format correctly. So if you're curious, just go to bookapodcast.com. You can see the show notes, the resources, the links, all the good stuff uh, along with the episode itself. Next question though for you, Casey, where do you find inspiration outside of photography? Yeah, I love this one. So my first one, my go-to always is driving with really loud music. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We have to at least share like what kind of music do you have particular musicians? Bands? Oh, I have, I am a music lover. Okay. I love all kinds of music. So it definitely has to do with mo- like what kind of mood I'm in. Yes. I have so many different playlists from like country playlists. Like I love country music in the summer. It's just, it's so great when it's warm and you can drive with your windows down. It's, I know, you know, I really, I feel you. I know country music's not for everybody and it it actually took a little while to grow on me too. I don't, I don't actively listen to it, but I do there. It does create a certain vibe and feel. I live in Tennessee too, so it's kind of fitting, but (laughs) yeah, it it really does give a certain vibe that that's fun to, at least some of it's fun to listen to. Yeah. And then I, I'm, I have like, angry playlists <laughs> yes and just like good singing music good throwback music yeah my the playlist that i made for late for labor when i had my daughter yeah that's like basically all of my favorite songs so that's been a huge favorite since i made that one well, that's cool including christmas music because my daughter was born on december 22nd so no that's way. a great one yeah yeah but i just i don't know what it is about driving like uh, driving with loud music, but I come up with really great ideas. I've had to pull over on the side of the road yeah. and record like a voice memo before. Yeah. Yeah. So like that's probably more like business ideas that I kind of come up with there. And then traveling is my other big one. That's when I, I feel like I get really inspired more so in the photography world is traveling, just getting out of your own day-to-day scenery, even if if I feel really stuck, so I live about an hour and 15 minutes outside of DC in Northern Virginia. I live, um, on a, on a five uh, acre property. So like kind of in the middle of nowhere. So if I am just feeling stuck and I really just like need to get out of my own day to day scene, I drive to DC and just get into the city, yep. go to a museum. If I, you know, don't have the budget or the time to hop on a plane somewhere. But when I do travel, I really try and take time to, put my phone down, look around. I, I always shoot a roll of film when I travel. I have a 35 millimeter 
little, I don't even know what model it is if Nikon, but I got it for $25 on Craigslist. Brilliant. It's, it's a beast. It's the best. And I love shooting film when I travel because yeah. especially as photographers, then you don't have to act like download it to your computer, get it into Lightroom, edit it. It's just click, send it off. And then, I mean, I have like a bunch of my travel film photography printed and hung in our house. I love doing that. So travel is a huge place for inspiration for me and just watching people which sounds kind of creepy, but especially because as a wedding photographer and a portrait photographer, I really like kind of observing how people interact with yeah, each other. hundred percent. And with film photography, when you send, you talked about sending it off. I'm assuming you, you send the film off. Is there a particular lab that you like working with? I use the fine lab. Do you? Okay. That's cool. So yeah. do, do they send you like a pre prepaid envelope or something like that? You just drop the film in or how does that work? So I send it to them in like a, I send the film in like a little padded. I have like these branded padded packets that I had from when I used to send USBs. Okay. So I put, I drop it in there and just send it. And then they have like a credit card on file that they charge. And then they just upload the scans to Dropbox. That's cool. That's really Mm -hmm. cool. And then they send the negatives, I think like every three months or something like that. Huh. Okay. All right. That makes sense. They like hold your negatives for a period of time that I can't remember. I think it's 90 days. Which is kind of brilliant too, because then you can always follow up and order more. I think that's, that's kind of a cool idea. Yeah. And then you can have the negatives. One thing that I will do like eventually in my life is, is put together a print shop of like all of my film travel shots and having the negatives for that is obviously important. Oh, for sure. For printing and things like that, for printing big pieces. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's huge. Very cool. Yeah, it kind of inspires me actually to grab my, I have a medium format camera, oh, medium Yashica, format. that I just love. I need to pull that out and start shooting with it a little bit. I think it'd be fun. Um, I started this year, I want to shoot a roll of film of my daughter, yes. like at least every two to three months, yeah. just because that's a nice, easy, easy way to take photos of her. Because I have, I kid you not, 20,000 photos of her on my phone right. that I don't really do that much with. Right. Yep. So. <laughs> no, it's such a great medium. It's such a throwback for me. That's what I started in. And um, I, I think I need to go back to a little bit more. Tell me about the, the most impactful business or self-help book that you've read or listened to recently. Yes, I loved this. So I just listened to Gabby, um, Gabby Bernstein's Super Attractor on audiobook. It's called Super what again? Super Attractor. A super Attractor. Okay. It's very woo woo. She taught, I mean, Gabby's amazing. Her stuff is, this is probably her furthest out there woo woo book, but it just called to me in a time in my life when I needed it. And it's been the journaling exercises that I've done from this audiobook have yeah. been life changing. How so? I have so. This has been my biggest breakthrough in a really long time. But one of the journaling prompts in her book was identify it was something like this, like identify places in your life where you're acting out of fear instead of desire. And when I really like wrote and thought about it, I kind of realized that being in hustle mode is actually my comfort zone and that. I am acting out of fear that if I don't hustle 24 seven, I'm not going to get to achieve my dreams, which is not true. <laughs> yeah, no, and I'm, I'm literally writing this down fear versus desire because this is this is really eye opening concept. There are so many journaling prompts and meditation. So she has like a meditation album that you can purchase with the book, which I highly recommend doing them. So you do like a little bit of meditation and then you journal and there were just a lot of breakthroughs that I had. I did this in like, I probably listened to the book, did the journaling in like three to five days. And this was like two weeks ago. I was just feeling like really directionless and just not sure where to pick up from where I was. And yeah, this pretty much since January 3rd or whenever, like, or probably like January 6th when everyone went back to work, I have just been putting in 12 to 15 hour days working so hard and just pushing myself to the limits all the time. And then, you know, I had a little bit of like a wrench thrown in my plans 
at the beginning of this month. And so it, to me, just felt like a massive wake up call from the universe that I needed to slow down, yeah. majorly slow down. Yeah. Because what I think was happening was that because I was so nose, just like nose to my work for so long, I was missing so many opportunities because mm. I was working too hard. Um, opportunities in what sense? What do you mean? I think I like missed, hmm, how do I explain this? I think I missed opportunities to slow down and be more connected. And I think when you are so deeply focused on something, working at it 24 seven, you're too deep in it. So I think I was too deep in my work to remove myself and see a big picture. And I was missing a lot of the throws I was taking because of that. And instead of slowing down and evaluating things and just taking a pause, I think that I was kind of missing the mark a lot in my messaging, in the content that I was producing. And I think had I had slowed down, I could have seen the big picture without having to work 12 to 15 hours a day for an entire month. (laughs) I like that. Yeah. You know, the, the, this, and you actually mentioned this to me, I think before we started recording this, this hustle, mentality that our culture has kind of gotten into our mm-hmm. industry, at least anyway. And honestly, I, th- I think Gary Vaynerchuk has played a, a pretty big role in that. Um, are you familiar? I love Gary though. Oh, and, and he's, and I do as well for, for multiple, I mean, he's, his, his message is clear. It's consistent. Uh, I love the, the, the simplicity of that. Um, I, I have a ton of respect for his so-called hustle. Uh, but then he's also working, you know, 70, 80 hours a week. He only sees his kids on the weekend. Like I, I don't, I don't know if that's really what we should all be trying to do. And and, and to his credit, he says that very thing. Mm-hmm. But I, I just, I'm not sure. I, I think that, that again, that, that whole pendulum thing where it swings one way to the extreme, a lot of times in our culture, we've, we've kind of gotten obsessed with this idea. But at the end of the day, is it actually benefiting us at, on the bigger picture level like it should? And to your point, and, and I love that you bring this up, are you actually spending your time intelligently? Just because you're busy doesn't mean you're doing what you need to be doing. You could potentially be doing what you're doing you know, 60 hours a week. You could be doing it in 20 hours a week if you actually took a step back for a second and yep. thought about it more intelligently, more proactively. It's so good. Yeah, and I think, I think what's important for me to say is that hustling and working really hard and putting the time in got me to where I am. I mean, I picked up a camera for the first time without knowing how to use it in the summer of 2016. And I was able to leave my full-time job six months after that. So I worked really hard for that. But I think, and and I do think that you need to put in the time and you need to put in the work. Yeah. But there, there is a time where, and I think this is like one of the benefits of getting older and wiser is you can slow down. You don't have to keep that pace in order to grow your business. And also the other thing, um, I have a business coach and she was just like, why are you in a rush? (laughs) Like, like, it's going to happen. I can see any that it's going to happen. Yeah. Don't rush there. Let's like enjoy our journey there. And I was like, yep. Okay. This is making more sense. And it just made me feel so much better. And the, I mean, the other thing is, is my husband said this to me because I was like running around crazy being like, oh my gosh, I got to get everything ready because my course launch is happening on this date. And I'm just, I'm running out of time. And he was like, you control your course launch. <laughs> so you can literally, you haven't even told anyone when you're launching yep. it. Like yep. you can change that. I was like, I can. Oh, my oh yeah. <laughs> you're right. That's funny. Um, so I, I think, you know, taking advantage of being entrepreneurs and having our own schedule when we're deep in work, we forget. Yep. We forget that we have the full control. Really, really, really good conversation. Yet another place where we could literally stop the podcast and we would have said more than enough. Um, But I really appreciate you sharing your perspective on that. I think it's so, so valuable. I do want to shift, though, to kind of our primary topic for today, which has to do with simplifying Instagram marketing. And leading up to the conversation, you had actually mentioned a couple of reasons why Instagram is such a struggle for photographers. Can you start out by sharing those with our listeners? Yeah. So the biggest struggle I see with my photography coaching clients is that 
And as photographers, we, so we have a deep emotional tie to our work. It's our art. And that's really important because I think that that when you have a deep emotional tie to your work, that's what makes it yours and really unique and really wonderful. But I do think it, it really interferes in successfully marketing photography businesses and with Instagram specifically, because it's a visual platform, I think people get really hung up on what photo to post because they're seeking such validation for their emotional work, which is not fair for anyone to go through. Like if they post a photo that they are so proud of and really just have deep emotional ties to, and like it's got really low engagement, it's like the lowest engaged photo. What I worry about photographers is that they're now afraid to shoot work like that because no one liked it on Instagram, which is like the saddest thing I've ever heard. So I think what I talk to with my photography um, coaching clients with Instagram specifically is like, sometimes I make them like break up with their art for marketing purposes because it's, again, it's not about you. It's about them. So if you want to successfully market to your ideal client so that you can keep shooting awesome emotional work, you need to think about what are they going to love? Not necessarily like what you think is your best work. Cause those are two separate, those are two separate things. And so I think that's a big challenge. And, and again, like that ties into the other challenge where I feel like people think that they need to change people's lives every time they post to Instagram, which is just not true. But yeah, that's the biggest struggle I see with wedding photographer, portrait photographers in general on Instagram. And it, so by kind of setting that thought process aside, how does that that simplify it for them? I mean, it, is it very simply just minimizing the overwhelm hmm. when they go to post? What, what does that look like? One of the things I offer clients when they have, when they stumble on what image to post, I kind of give them the flip side. I say, okay, why don't you write a caption about, you know, let's say write a caption about why you love taking getting ready photos with the bride. Write the caption first, then we'll find an image. So that is like a simple trick that I use to kind of start retraining brains because I feel like when you can write a caption that's a little bit more marketing focused, you can then find an image easier than picking the image first and figuring out what to say about the image. Interesting. That's kind of cool. Yeah, I think because I had like seven years of marketing experience before becoming a photographer, that has always been my first filter. So that's kind of where I've always started is, okay, I'm going through this gallery I just delivered. What are my, like, what are my potential clients really going to connect with? And not, it's not so much about what I'm, what I connect with just as like a marketing lens. And that's not to say that you shouldn't post art you're really proud of. I just want to make sure that if you're posting work for you, put it out into the world, be super proud of it. And don't worry about likes or comments or what anyone else says, just put it out there. And, you know, I think in a caption, like sharing why you love an image is so connective. Um, I think a lot of photographers get caught in describing what's already in the photo. (laughs) Like, in (laughs) like, you can see it already. (laughs) Right, which is such a natural thing to do when you're when you're writing captions. Sure. But I you know, I always challenge pretty much all of my small business coaching clients is think about why you picked to post something and if you can't think about why, don't post it. People are going to connect with you if you're really excited about what you're going to post. So the other thing is like, yeah, I think being really excited about what you're posting about goes such a long way than like you're like, oh, I need to post an Instagram today because I have to, because the internet told me to. Like, honestly, that's such a waste of time. <laughs> um, and it's just not going to be effective marketing if you're just kind of like posting to be relevant because you're supposed to post every other day or whatever rule you've heard lately on Instagram. So I think posting stuff that you're really excited about is always going to do better. Yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, and it makes it more fun too. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with having a little bit of fun. I I think 
I think a lot of times strategy gets lost under the guise of having fun. So there's got to be both, but yeah, having fun needs to be included in that mix too. And then that's, that's a good reminder. So photographers, I mean, the, the challenges that, that you're talking about here, the first one largely centers around this idea of kind of being emotionally intertwined with images and that getting in the way of focusing on the question, which is, or the answer to the question, which is what is my message? What am I trying to convey? And so actually starting mm-hmm. with writing a caption and then finding a met- or an image to go along with that. I think that's a great potential solution there. There was another kind of struggle of sorts, and you, you alluded to this already, that you mentioned to us prior to the com- or prior to our interview today, which was people are getting caught up with or overwhelmed by algorithms, the shadow banning, all these mm, rules. Yeah. You mentioned the word rules a second ago. Yeah. How does that kind of, and how much, I guess, how much importance should we be placing on that? And how can we kind of step away from that for the sake of, again, enjoying what we're doing on Instagram? Yeah. So I think, I think the biggest misconception on the algorithm is that it's working against you. If you use it properly, properly, it will help you. Um, and so the algorithm is seen as this, like, I don't know, it's like made out to be a monster and it's just isn't if you're using it properly. So I think, I think staying up to date with new Instagram best updates, practices. Yeah. best practices and things like that is great. And it's pretty easy. I feel like there's tons of podcasts where people are constantly talking about what is the new hashtag rule and all of that. But what I kind of, I've always loved using it, using Instagram always. I've been a user pretty much, I think since like 2010. So And what I always have loved about Instagram is connecting with people. And so I think that we're really missing why Instagram was created in the first place. We've now been so overwhelmed by business profiles and hashtags and tagging and all of those, all of these things have kind of led to that pendulum swing you're talking about. We're just so overwhelmed. Like first it was this like, really fun app to share photos of your life. And now it's just like a beast. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to help with my, I have Instagram TV is about Instagram blog posts is I really want to help people have fun on Instagram again, um, because that's how you're going to make connections with people. That's the whole point. Even if you're a business, you want to make connections with past clients, future clients, current clients and beyond. Um, like I have, I have moms of grooms and moms of brides that are like my biggest cheerleaders on Instagram. They're amazing. They refer me to people. It's crazy, but I really make time to answer their direct messages, to answer their comments on my Instagram posts and connect with them. Like all of them like DM me every time I post anything about my daughter, my daughter. So I think like, instead of doing Instagram purely as a marketing tool. Mm. Remember that you're there to connect with other humans. Yeah. It's a really remarkable place to connect with people. And I think we miss that in all of the like overwhelm and crazy rules. That's a great that we're all supposed to be following. Yeah. No, that's a that's a great reminder. Connection. Yeah. I I mean what it comes down to it, that's where it starts having clear messaging and um those are great kind of first steps in the right direction. But I I want to kind of go a different direction speaking of with this conversation at the moment and we're continuing this idea of this theme of simplifying our efforts on Instagram share three things that photographers should stop doing um, in order to simplify their efforts and make their experience more enjoyable yeah so I think um, the first one has two sides so the first one is to stop spontaneous posting and what I mean by that is like you are opening your phone and you're kind of going like, Oh, okay. I have to post to Instagram today. I haven't posted in like three days. What am I going to post? And you're just kind of like, it's low effort. You're not really excited about it. Right. You're it's, it's a drag. So I think stop doing that. It's honestly a waste of your time to put out a piece of content. That's you're not excited about what I, what I really recommend is, and this is what I do. I schedule, it's on my calendar every two weeks to spend two hours doing Instagram content. Okay. And it only takes you two hours or two weeks worth of content. Yeah. Usually less. Really? Wow. But I think that's because I've been doing it a while. And I also have, so I have a great freebie resource that is, um, it's a calendar with 30 free Instagram content ideas for wedding photographers. So it has like a prompt for every, a different prompt for every single day. Okay. And so I kind of use that 
I have like, is that something that um, we can link to in the show notes? Yeah. Yep. Where, where can we link to, where would they find that? They will find that I can give you guys, it's an email opt-in so okay, cool. I can send you the, the, the email opt-in and then they'll automatically get the freebie once they um, opt in for email. Perfect. We'll, we'll put a link yeah. to that in the show notes for everybody listening it's in. It's super popular. I, and I think it just helps, it kind of helps the habit form of being more intentional about what you're writing in your captions, what images you are choosing. It just starts creating the habit to be more intentional yeah. because it's a hard place to start. For me, obviously, I had a marketing background, so I had been doing this for other brands for years because I even go a step further and I plan like a full-on yearly content calendar. So like in January, I usually talk about engagement sessions, the excitement of engagement sessions, because guess what? A ton of couples got engaged in November and December. And then in February, I usually start kind of getting back into some wedding planning content, helping couples prepare for their wedding day with like blog posts and captions like that. This year has been wonky, but that's, (laughs) that's what I usually do. And then once we get into like April, May, when wedding season approaches, that's when I really start talking about my client experience. So I have like a yearly content calendar of content that I talk about. That's pretty strategic, but I think the starting small instead of like starting really big like that is underrated. So just being more intentional about what you're putting out on Instagram. Stop um, the un- the spontaneous posting. I, I I like the way that you phrase that. <laughs> <laughs> That's really good. What what's another what's another thing that photographers should stop doing on Instagram? Yep. So stop using the same thirty hashtags on every single photo. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and let me tell you why. Because okay. the same people are seeing your stuff. You're not hitting any. Well, first of all, you're probably going to get tagged as spam. If you're doing if you're copying from an from a phone notes 30 hashtags and putting that on every single one of your photos, you're probably getting alerted as spam on Instagram. Really? Okay. So that's number 1. And then the second thing is if you have like un unre- like unrelevant hashtags on there, you're also going to get hit with like a spam filter. So I have a whole, um, and I can send you the link. I have a whole Instagram TV of my hashtag strategy, but what, what I recommend is relevant hashtags. And I don't think you need to use all 30. Like if you can think of 30, cool. If you can't 15 is great, especially if they're really relevant to the photo. And are you writing those manually every time? Or are you using some kind of tool to do it with or to find? I typically, So I have like, I have a document of, I have a document of hashtags that I update regularly so that I am like always, I have my content producer research hashtags all the time for me. And she kind of like updates them so that again, like if you're using the same hashtags all the time, you're just hitting up the same people and you're not really hitting a new audience. So that's kind of why you might hit a plateau in growth or reach or anything like that. If you're just like, you're just hitting the same people up all the time instead of branching out yeah. um, and also serving people. If you serve someone, so if somebody is searching in a hashtag, that's like Virginia winery wedding, their eye is going to be for a photo of a bride and a groom in a vineyard. Right? So if your hashtag is really relevant to what something, to what someone is searching for, they're going to, they're going to have an eye for your photo and sure. they're just going to connect it right away instead of like someone searching in like a Virginia wedding, which is still great, but you have a really good chance of connecting with someone in a more like relevant specific hashtag. That totally makes sense. Um, and by the way, I have to throw this out here and I should have done this um, quite some time ago already. Everybody listening in, if you go to Casey, C-A-S-E-Y, Crow, C-R-O-W-E, Taylor on Instagram, you, you can actually see what Casey is doing on her Instagram account. She's got over 15,000 followers, so she figured something out. But I just wanted to throw that out there, Casey, so everybody kind of has a little bit more context to the conversation. Tell me the third thing that photographers should stop doing. Yeah, and we kind of already went over this, but um, stop describing what's already visible because you're if if somebody is looking at your photo and it's a photo of a bride and groom cheersing on their wedding day, you're going to lose someone if they go to read your caption and it's like 
champagne is delicious on your wedding day because they've already seen it. It's repeat content. So if you really want to connect with potential clients or even connect with the clients that you, you know, I don't know if even the bride and groom of that photo are going to feel engaged enough to comment. But if you talk about what it was like to celebrate their wedding, what it meant to you, there's a way bigger chance that they're going to be like, oh my God, we had the best time with you too. Um, And I think the other thing with captions that a lot of people are missing out is calls to action. You don't necessarily, like I think calls to action get a bad rep because I think a lot of people think that calls to action means you're selling something, but you should be adding calls to action to most of your captions, even if it's like a comment, a yellow heart. If you have something really fun planned this weekend, just something that gets people engaging with you. Sure. And I have a whole Instagram TV on this too. It's like when you start to ask people to engage with you, it's not going to happen immediately. You kind of have to like open the door and like warm them up to engaging with you. But um, we can, I, I can send you a link to that too, but well, and you actually, th- there's, so the third thing you mentioned here was stop describing what's in the photo, which is a great reminder, even for me and for our, our business accounts too. Cause it, it really, it's easy to kind of fall into that trap, but it's so obvious <laughs> and so cliche. Um, but there was actually an, another one that you'd mentioned ahead of time to us, uh, that I think is really interesting too. And you said, stop taking it personally. Um, yeah. don't let the amount of likes and comments be a reflection of who you are, a bride might see the photo with 50 likes geotagged at her venue and connect with it enough to book you. That's really a good exactly. reminder because, you know, likes isn't true engagement. It's easy for somebody no. to scroll through. And, and I think I've mentioned this story on the podcast sometime before. I was having a conversation with my son one day about a, a post that he had liked. And I asked him if he had read the text and, and he said that he hadn't. And I think this is a very common behavior for uh for a lot of people, if not most people going through Instagram, they're scrolling quickly, double tap, mm-hmm. maybe double tap, you know, and, and they keep going and they're not actually truly engaging it with it. If they're actually reading that text and responding and commenting on it, now we're talking about actual engagement. There's a yeah. big difference. And yet we're also obsessed with the the likes. Can you comment just briefly on on that idea? Well, I mean, the first part of that is that likes are going away. <laughs> True. <laughs> Which I think is it's interesting. So I think like you'll still be able to see how many likes you get on a photo, but I am interested to see. And my hope in this is that people are connecting more and they're commenting more as engagement. But yeah, I think likes are not a a true sign of engagement. I think comments are a much stronger sign of engagement. Yeah. They have Um, to make the effort, right? To actually type some words and respond to what you said or comment on the picture. Can we also say if somebody makes the effort to comment on your photo, please comment back to them? Yeah, well, that, that's a good segue, actually. So my next question had to do with you, you shared a couple of ideas about how to build and nurture your community to make it fun. And this was the first point. It just It's very simply reply to every single comment. Mm-hmm. And does that, I mean, obviously it affects the, the the way that the client feels, a potential client, the person interacting with you, how they feel about you and your brand. Does does that type of response actually affect the algorithm as well? It does. It affects simply replying to every comment, even if it's one comment, even if it's someone just comments a heart, replying to that comment not only helps boost you um, in the algorithm, but it also shows people that you're engaged. So mm. people are going to be more likely to engage with you if they know that you're engaging back. Now, the second point that you mentioned was you said every time you get a new follower, go like mm-hmm. and comment on their feed. And this is an interesting one. Um, I, I think maybe I'm just too a little bit too OCD, but like I use my personal account for business. But then if I'm actually looking at the feed, a lot of times it's it's more for my just my personal enjoyment if I'm following 5,000 people, then I, everything just kind of gets lost in the mix. Oh, 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 okay. So, so let me clarify. So when a new person follows me, yeah, I don't always follow them back, but I do always go, I, I go to their profile. Okay. Cause I also, I do wind up blocking accounts that feel like spam to me. Sure. Um, or just feel a little bit creepy. Sure. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if somebody follows me, I'll go to their page, like especially other wedding photographers who I want to create a relationship with. I go, I go through their feed. I like and comment on at least three photos. 
every now and then, if I have the time, I will send them like you can do video DMs in, in Instagram. I will just takes me literally 10 seconds to be like, Hey, I so appreciate. Um, usually I do this with new people who like follow me, like a bunch of my stuff comment. I kind of give that love back and say, Hey, thank you so much for giving me your attention. It means so much to me. I love what you're doing. Yeah. Um, and just building that relationship with my community. That's good. Again, to go back to the fact that the reason that I love using Instagram is because I really love connecting with people. And especially, you know, I really love helping small business owners and helping photographers improve their business. So I really want to make sure. And the other thing that this kind of does when, when you have a real human interaction with someone on Instagram, they're less likely to unfollow you in a couple weeks or a couple months if you've made the effort to connect with them because they kind of, they feel that personal connection and they kind of feel that guilt Whereas if they just followed you and then, okay, they're like looking through your post, they don't really feel that personal connection to you. They might just like unfollow you a few weeks later. Um, but if you take the time to make that connection, yeah. you're going to retain your audience, not just get new followers, but actually retain an audience. And I also think if nurturing and building an online community is not something you're interested in, that's okay too. You don't have to do this. It's just if it is something that you feel inspired by and excited about, it's gone such a long way for me just to anyone who follows me to just give them, you know, they've invested time in me that they're following me. So I want to give that back to them as well. I think that's a great way to finish the conversation. And it's a really good reminder for me too. I, I, I appreciate the people who are willing to actually take the time to follow me. And like you said, care to, to pay attention to what I'm doing, but I need to return that favor and show similar respect, um, make the effort to engage at least a little bit. Um, I think that's a great reminder for all of us. Right. Like, you know, I have a lot of wedding photographers who are like, no one's liking my stuff or commenting. I'm like, okay, cool. Are you liking other people's right. stuff and comment? Like just treat other people on Instagram the way that you want to be treated. And I guarantee you, you will see and feel like massive change. Will you share one more time where our listeners can follow what you're doing online, learn a little bit more about um, even the education that you have to offer as well? Yeah. So on Instagram, I am at Casey Crow Taylor. Crow is with an E. And then my wedding photography business and my education business are all over on CaseyCrowTaylor.com. Perfect. We'll put it in the show notes. Thank you once again, Casey, for making time to hang with us. Thank you. This was so fun. Thank you so much for listening to the Boca Podcast. Will you let us know what you thought by leaving a review of the podcast in the Apple Podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast and suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca Podcast is brought to you by Milu, the simplest way for photographers and coordinators to collaborate on shot lists and timelines for weddings, parties, and other amazing events. Visit milu, M-I-I-L-U dot com. This podcast is also brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the professional photographer. Visit photographersedit.com. dot